Okay, so um, hello everybody and thank you for having me. Today I want to talk about a project called Comtiles, um, which I worked on during the last year. And I successfully used in some projects with significantly reducing the hosting cost on global scale tile sets. So the main problem which um, Comtiles uh, tries to solve is um, the limitation which um, the most widely used tile archive formats or tile container formats like GeoPackage and especially MP tiles have, though they are designed only with a POSIX conform file system access in mind, and they are not designed for the usage within a cloud native environment. So Comtiles tries, uh, tries to overcome these limitations um, by being a, a cloud native, cloud optimized format from scratch for large or global scale tile sets. Okay, so, um, but before we start, let, you, let me introduce myself. My name is Markus Dremmel and I work as a geospatial software architect at a company called Rode & Schwarz in Germany. And I also work as a lecturer at the Deckendorf Institute of Technology, which is a university of applied sciences. Um, in Germany, mo most uh, focus is on teaching vector data processing on spatial systems. Okay, um, let me start by giving you a quick overview of how um, a conventional way of deploying global scale or map tile sets, global scale tile sets um, in an, on a dedicated server or virtual machine. So without the usage of an of a cloud environment, um, you have something like the following. Um, at the top, um, so we're talking about now a planet, um, yeah, a Mapbox vector tile planet, and you want to deploy this planet to a Sleepy Maps client, like MapLibre, OpenLayer, or Cesium. So the first step is because this, um, you, yeah, you download the, the planet uh, from a mirror, then you have about 65 gigabyte of data, but this planet is unstructured, there are no zoom levels or, or overviews, and no, in general, no uh, cartographic generalization. So you have to transfer um, this data set into an, yeah, into Mapbox vector tiles, for example, and you can use tools like oh, map tiles tools or planet tiler. And then you have an, oh, sorry, an MB tiles file with, ch with, with is just simply an SQLite database with a uh, special scheme. And um, we having, if you converted that, you have around about 360 million tiles for a planet scale tile set. So we're talking about zoom level zero to 14 for the vector tiles and about 90 gigabyte in size. And to um, make this um, SQLite, so this MB tiles database accessible to a Sleepy Maps client, you have to translate um, the HTTP XYZ queries into um, yeah, SQL queries, for example, via tile server. For example, you could use tile server GL. And you also want to do this, uh, for example, in our projects, um, we have done this for uh, a lot of other tile sets. For example, you want to overlay the base map with contour lines, or you want to display shadings, or also you want to, to use the new uh, map libre feature where you can extrude terrors, so uh, displaying 2.5D terror data. And the base, of, the base of this is, for example, terror DEM tile set. Or if you're using uh, the state-of-the-art 3D maps renderer, Cesium, then you want to use for the Terra quantized uh, tiles and for um, displaying 3D uh, buildings, um, the 3D tiles format. And if you're aggregating all this together, you have around about over a billion tiles and terabytes of data. So, and we also faced this challenge and we had um, some request to bring that into the cloud. So this architecture, which you're seeing here, um, because it should be more scalable, more, more cost efficiency, for example. But the main problem which we faced is that there's in general in the cloud, you have a separation between um, the storage and the compute, which means you have your tile server is running something like a uh, function as a service environment, like AWS um, Lambda, for example, or Azure functions, or in a Docker container. But all these uh, services are ephemeral, which means you don't have direct access to the file system. And for the storage of the tiles, 
or in general for static assets, um, in the cloud you're using an object storage. So that's the way for deploying uh, cheap, uh, or it's a way to deploy tiles in a cheap way. And it's also very scalable. So it scales near infinitely. But the point is you have now not further a POSIX compliant um, access when we're talking about Unix distributions. You now have uh, an HTTP interface which um, these um, object storage is offering. So this architecture is not working anymore and we also face these problems in, in a lot of pro uh, projects and there are Without the use of a cloud-optimized format, you have probably two major options. So the first option is you could directly host the map tiles on that object storage. But um, the problem is that you have to load up hundreds of millions of tiles, so and you have to pay every single uh, request because these are put requests, um, which you have to pay from for the cloud provider. And if you have um, these aggregated tiles, for example, 3D tiles, and uh, so then you have even billions of tiles and over yeah, ter terabytes of data which have to, you have to upload. And the second option is, which was more favorite option from us, is that you use a dedicated database where you are importing the tiles from the MP tiles database, for example, in an Amazon RDS database. But the problem is if you, then you have to, um, yeah, it's, well, it's very expensive. We have calculated this and we were really surprised how, yeah, how expensive that was because you have to pay the database and yeah, the, the, business, uh, the container or the, yeah, the service where the tile server is running. So we, we stopped then because it was, like I said, too expensive. We, um, and then we decided we need something like an MB tiles or geo package for the cloud, which is more co cost efficient and which is easier to handle in the cloud, especially for deployment. Um, so I know maybe you heard something about um, these new categories of cloud optimized formats. Um, there was a lot of talks in different categories of um, because there's a wide range of uh, cloud native formats. So for example, there is uh, something like the mother of all cloud optimized formats, which is uh, the COC. So the cloud optimized GeoTIFF, with, which is optimized for, yeah, or which is for satellite or raster data. And um, yeah, which also was the inspiration for building um, such a cloud optimized archive for tiles. Then you have something like uh, for point clouds, which is uh, cloud optimized point cloud a file format, then you have the newer generation of vector formats, which is for example, flat geo buffer geoparky. And then you have um, the tile based cloud optimized format. On the one hand, you have um, something for uh, N or multi-dimensional arrays like SAR or TileDB, which are not geo specific, but I thought, or we thought also about extending that and, and bringing the geo into that. But we ended up building our own solution um, so our own tile archive solution um, with com tiles. So there's also another uh, solution maybe you heard of, which is very widely used also, which is um, PM tiles. So at the time we are developed that, we were not aware of um, that file format and we um, did some, yeah, some other approach, uh, especially in designing the index and regarding, regarding the metadata. So, and some distinction between uh, the tile archive and um, the vector data because now you could think, yeah, why, why not using um, such a new uh, vector data clou or cloud optimized vector data format like flat GeoBuff or GeoParky. So they, in my opinion, they are mainly um, optimized for the usage of yeah, analytical workflows and processing. But um, the tile archives are really focused on um, visualization. So bringing that um, sleepy maps user experience to the cloud. Because in my opinion, such a um, tile archive only have a, has, a, has a chance for a wide adoption if it offers the same user experience uh, which you have when you're using an, an tile backend with a database and a server. And this, this was also one of my main concerns. If this is possible to achieve this sleepy maps user experience, which means when you zoom in the map or you pan in an 
in a global base map, in a browser-based map, um, that you get instant feedback, so with no delay and then a very fluent workflow. And this, this was also one of the main challenges to, to achieve such an user experience. So um, some, just a, a short recap over the principles um, of cloud native, maybe, or you probably heard something about in the conference. So the basic of all these formats is you are deploying it on an object storage, like AWS S3, Azure Cloud, uh, uh, Azure Prop Storage, or, uh, or Google Cloud Storage, for example. Um, because it's, like I said, it's very scalable and it's very cost efficient, very cheap to store large amounts of data. So storing about uh, 100 gigabytes cost between one and five euro, depending on, on the provider. And then the, the base principle of this is you um, can read port, uh, portions, so chunks of a file via HTTP range request. So if you have the whole file, like on the right here, which about 90 gigabyte in size, you can um, now only query the specific tile which you're interested um, within that archive we are HTTP range requests. So which is uh, partial content to a six. And um, to, to know where um, these tiles are located within this archive and how large, so the size of these tiles, you need something like a spatial index. And then um, also a very important concept, you have only one file, but they are also the metadata are, um, yeah, are contained for describing the tile sets, for the tile set. So, okay, what's ComTiles in, um, in general? So you, it's based, like I said, on the ideas of cloud-optimized GeoTIFF and extended for the usage of raster, but especially, or in particular, for vector map tile sets. Um, it's streamable and especially read-optimized um, for hosting map tiles at global scale, and you can directly access um, these map tiles from the browser, so you don't need an and tile backend with a database or server. You just store them on an, on an S3, for example, and you can yeah, directly query that from, from the browser. So I want to give you a short um, overview of how such of a basic concept, so how COM tiles are basically working with a short sequence diagram. So on the left, you have your Sleepy Maps map client, and on the right, for example, map Libre, and on the right, you have an object storage or and, and CDN. So the first step is you query the header and the metadata, which are describing the tile set, and the metadata are based on the two-dimensional tile matrix set and tile set metadata uh, specification from the OGC. Um, so yeah, they are describing um, the tile set and um, the uh, um, the tile matrix set, uh, so the um, extension of the tile set, and this also the basic concept or the base for having random access to the index, because I, we, we know the, the, uh, the extension of or the bounds of uh, the tile set, and we can calculate portions of the index based on, yeah, on the boundaries of the tile set. Then um, the next step is, and there I put on the most, uh, the most of the time and tried different approaches is how to design the index to be very efficient. So the goal is to have as uh, yeah, few requests as possible to, like I said, to have this map, uh, Sleepy Maps user experience. So um, what uh, then happened is I, I choose the uh, compressed index pyramid, which has about 20 kilobyte in size. And with that index pyramid, you're getting uh, all tiles for the sum level uh, zero to seven, which are around about um, 21,000 uh, index records, um, which then you can access the real, uh, the actual tiles. So uh, with that, you have a basic overview over the frequently accessed tiles. So, and then you have all um, all the addresses and all the sizes of the tiles for zoom level um, zero to seven. And now you can access the, the actual tiles um, uh, yeah, via X, Y, uh, Z range requests. And 
uh, a, a feature which I have worked on and which really improved performance on HTTP1 requests and also in particular reduce the transfer cost is the tile batching because you now can batch together different uh, different tile requests. For example, if you have an, an HD monitor with uh, in full screen, you have around about 15 tiles. And because these tiles are ordered within the archive on a space filling curve, you can reduce um, the requests to two or three, uh, yeah, to two or three re tile requests, two or three range requests, which can uh, reduce the number of tile requests up to 19%. And the next step is then if you go zoom deeper into the map and you are um, go beyond, for example, if you're talking about planet scale tile set beyond zoom level seven, so eight to, to 14, I, we are using a concept called index fragments. So which um, is, I also uh, is used in the naming is used, I think in tile DB. So a, a fragment is just an aggregation of index records together. So which are per default 4096 40, uh, 4, index records, which are a total size of 12 kilobytes. And these are also ordered on a space filling curve. And if you are deploying that on a CDN, we are talking about maybe on an average internet connection to 20 milliseconds, which this prefetch costs. So it can be even faster. So it's not, uh, not really noticeable for the user regarding the user experience. And the next step then is to, you now then can query, um, you can go on with that, you can query now the map tiles again and also do it in a batch, in a batch request. So batch together the, uh, the requests. And then again, you can load the index fragment on a, on a so lazy load the index fragments and uh, yeah, and go up to zoom level 14 that way. So these, um, my concerns um, that this will not have, or when I started the pro project, like I said at the beginning, I had some concerns if it's too much latency uh, for that prefetch request, but it, it turned out it's, uh, re it works really nice and like I said, uh, we have a lot of projects which are fine with that. But um, you have that additional fetch for portions of the index. So this may be 20 milliseconds or something if you are on, on an deploying on CDN. So one option is to use a serverless tile server, for example, uh, hosted on an AWS Lambda or um, cl on Cloudflare workers to eliminate that additional index request. Then another challenge is um, that storing large tile sets, like I said in the beginning on an object storage is very cheap, but um, the transfer costs and the egress costs can get very expensive because you can't limit on an object storage to only rage requests. Um, the user can always download the full, the full data set. That's some kind of pro, uh, problem, but there are the cloud providers are now supporting requester pays which the user then have to pay for the egress costs, so for the transfer costs. So you not have then any more that anonymous access, which can be a problem, but yes, you, you are not running out of costs. Um, then a the point is, uh, sadly, multi-part re multi -part range requests are not supported by cloud providers on object storage, but they are supported on a CDN. So that would also, if you're using a CDN, you can also further batch together that request. Um, another point is, which our CDN is solving that most cloud providers doesn't support HTTP2 for object storage, but for a CDN. And this is also very important features for tiles because on an HTTP1, uh, or for example, if HTTP1 endpoints, we are on object storage, you can on a Chrome can, uh, just uh, have six concurrent requests to one origin. So you have to, to download the first six uh, tiles, then the next six, and then, for example, the, the left, the last three tiles. And this um, overcomes HTTP2 with the multiplexing feature, which is a very important feature. So, and then another uh, problem can be uh, that compression is not supported via the content encoding header. 
in HTTP range request. It's only yeah supported for yeah you you have to bake it into um, your tile archive. And there would be some workaround if you're using a compression streams API, but this API is not yet supported on all browsers. So you have to ship your own decoding libraries for when you're using vector tiles. Uh, another feature which hopefully will be supported in the future, but currently not on CDNs, is the feature of dynamic compression. So that an, it is supported on a CDN for HTTP requests, but not for range requests. So that the, you can tell the, the uh, object storage to compress, to compress in different formats like broadly or GZIP or deflate. So th this would be all also very nice for um, um, yeah for com tiles because then it could be dy could by dynamically be compressed the index reference. And one point is also, but that's all mostly for all cloud native formats. They are really optimized for, for reading, not for writing. So updates are some kind of expensive because you mostly replace the whole data set. Okay, um, so the, the next steps um, which we are working on. So first we want to deploy. I have a an, an student which is working on his, his final thesis on bringing that to a final uh, one point zero version at the moment we have some release candidates and also working on uh, integrating into for example planet Tyler and currently only we have libraries for map libre but not for uh, leaflet for example so he is um, working on further supporting different uh, yeah different libraries but some stuff I am want to work on or still started to work on is support of 3D tiles, because this is a, a topic which I worked together with a colleague, I think maybe four to five years ago, we have written our own 3D, probably one of the first, uh, first 3D tiles converter, which convert um, buildings to um, yeah, uh, OSM buildings or, or different high, high um, resolution buildings to, to 3D tiles. But um, before, the 3D tiles next pack, it was not possible um, to have random access to uh, such a 3D tiles uh, data set. But now there's a new feature which is called implicit tiling, which is an extension on 3D tiles. And now um, 3D tiles has support for fixed spatial data structures, for example, for Quartry for 2D or an Octree for 3D, which allows random access. And we try to combine now this together with com tiles um, yeah, to, to also host or deploy 3D tiles in a cloud, on a cloud object storage. Um, then an, an, another point um, which I, we are working on is, um, so vector tiles are really, Mapbox vector tiles are really optimized. Um, they are using dictionary encoding for the tags, they are using for geometries like delta encoding, zigzag and variant because of uh, uh, protobufs, they are really optimized. But I think if you're bringing concept from this new cloud native format, like Parquet, for example, um, like the column oriented, uh, column -oriented approach um, for the properties of the features, so especially for the geometries, um, I think you can have quite a better compression, especially if you have a lot of points. So if you're going beyond zoom level 14 and, or, and on Sumo level 14 tiles, you will have uh, um, a lot of advantage. I'm late or? No, no, there's questions. I okay, yeah, just two. Okay, yeah. Uh, less two points, have I time? Yeah. yeah. So, okay, just quick. Um, the next uh, point is want to reach faster decoding, um, like zero encoding inspired, like I said, by GLTF, but this, this is some kind of hard. It's not like in 3D tiles if you have complex 3D models because you have uh, something uh, which is called layouting. You can, depending on the style, um, the, the tessellated geometries can change. And the last step which we are working on is that um, you can make also um, the tiles queryable um, so we are an additional secondary index, and this can reduce the number of features 
depending on the style, up to 50%. Because if you have a light or a dark seam, you mostly don't need, for example, poise or, or addresses. So you can just cut them, out, uh, cut them out because they are indexed and you compress them. And then you can use um, the multi-range requests on the CDN to batch them together again. And I think this can have also a big uh, yeah, influence of uh, the size of the tiles. So yeah, thank you. Uh, and if you have any questions, just go on. <laughs>